Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Winter Quarter ECE Colloquium, uh, Research Colloquium series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this series, um, who is our own Baosun Zhang professor in our own department. Uh, the theme of this series, as Baosun will tell you more about, is about energy systems, and the whole quarter will be different talks on this topic. Uh, so let me just introduce Bausen. He really needs no introduction, but uh, just for those who haven't uh, yet met him. Uh, Bausen is an assistant professor in our, uh, in our ECE department. He holds the Keith and Nancy Ratti Endowed Career Development Professorship. He received his uh, undergrad degree from University of Toronto in 2008, his PhD um, in ECE from Berkeley in 2013. And before joining UW, he also did a postdoc uh, was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford. He has received uh, the NSF Career Award and a number of best paper awards and publishes very broadly uh, in both literature on energy systems and uh, as well as machine learning and mathematical models of these systems and management and planning and optimization, uh, multiple directions. So without further ado, I'll uh, uh, leave the stage to Bausen. To take uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thanks. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off this series. So before we start with my talks, a reminder for the folks who's taking this course for credit, uh, check Canvas. The grading information is out. So basically, there is a short report due at the end of the quarter. So if you're taking the class for credit, uh, please go check it out. And with that, I'll start my talk. Let me share a screen. Can folks see it? Very good. Okay. All right. So the title of my talk is, uh, you know, broad, and what I want to do is basically do an introduction for the rest of the seminars we will have in this quarter. Right. So I will set up, you know, why is energy system research important? Why it's interesting? Why are we doing this? And why do we sort of choose the lineup of speakers that we did? Right. So. If you look at the power system, you look at electric grid, it's actually considered quite, you know, a crowning achievement of human engineering, right? So if you read the National Academy of Engineering as, you know, ranking of the greatest engineer achievement in the 20th century, the grid is number one. Basically the citation says that, you know, anytime you flicker, you know, if you flip a switch, you can get power from all different sources, from hydro, from coal, from solar, and this works seamlessly, right? And this is indeed the workhorse of the modern world. However, if you're following the news, this is you know, less true, for example. So this is, I only start from October 6, 2020, the last three months, and this is basically one newspaper. So if you go through the news about power systems or energy, it's not all that positive. For example, climate change and poor planning are causing California blackouts. You, we definitely all heard a lot about this on the news, right? And not only from you know, climate change, we have hacking, cyber attacks as a major concern for power systems. We have ice storm in Oklahoma, we have ice storms in the Northeast. So you have all of this news. So if we said, you know, the power grid is crowning achievement of the 20th century, then this workforce is really showing its age. It's really not as reliable as we want it to be. And the issue is not us, it's not just, you know, in the United States, right? You have, you know, cities all around the world, like China basically had to ration electricity for entire city. Okay? So you have places going dark left and right. And to stay close to home, this is a power outage in Seattle. And I experienced this. So my home had an outage for about three, four hours. And then my wife turned to me and said, hey, don't you work on this? I said, yes. And she said, okay, go fix it. Right, I want my power back on internet. So really, you know, have motivations both from the global scale, the national scale and close to home. And this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, I only pick, you know, these seven because I run a route on this slide. But basically, 
we all somehow has the idea that the power system you know, should be reliable. When you flip on light switch, you don't think about it. You expect light to be on, although the system is showing its age. Right? And at the same time, the power, the, the grid or the electrical system is getting more important. Because to achieve a sustainable future, really we need to add more things into the grid. For example, if you look at California, the goal is to essentially, you know, by 2035, have everything as electric vehicles. All of these will be charged by the electric grid, right? So we're adding massive amount of load onto the system, right? At the same time when the system is really showing its age. Similarly, if you look closer to home, in Seattle, there is a proposal basically for all new buildings to have electrical heating. So we have uh, the idea is to ban gas heating and make everything electrical for heating and cooling for HVAC systems. So the reason is really is still much more efficient and much cleaner to generate electricity in a large scale and ship it throughout this grid. So to achieve our sort of sustainable future, we really need the grid. We really need to the grid to still be the workhorse and to integrate more stuff. At the same time, the grid is you know, increasingly uh, showing its age and not being as reliable as you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. So the idea of this seminar, of the seminar series, is really to say that a well-functioning grid is fundamental to our lives, especially now, right? since we're all essentially relying on the fact that we have electricity in our lives. And this presents sort of significant challenges at the same time as opportunities. So this talk, we're going to look at the, some of the engineering challenge. So why, you know, as a grid, why do we need transformations in the electric grid in the, in the power system? And this will set up sort of the, you know, the fantastic number of talks we have in this quarter. I think so this really is the, you know, the sort of the, best lineup we could have hoped for for the talks. And then in this talk, I'm going into a little bit detail about the work we're doing at UW and how our work fits, fits into this broad theme of new research that's happening in the energy system. So if you look at the power system, right? What is the power system? The power system is really a, so the power system is really sort of as, in, as the middle or at the core we, we think of as a, uh, a system with wires, right? You know, power lines, huge towers, transmission lines. And around this core infrastructure system, there's a lot of things going around it, right? We have, you know, we have modeling, right? We need a mathematical model of the physical system we have. We need control, right? The power system will not work without advanced control. We have, nowadays we have sort of pretty advanced power electronics entering the system. We have a lot of data, new measurement data that we did not have before. And on top of it, we have sort of algorithms that have to operate the grid. So if you want to, you know, conceptually, you want to think about energy system, think of it as a core physical system sitting on the middle and the data, the control algorithms as layers on top of this physical system. Okay, so we have a physical layer that are the lines, the transformers, the power, things like this. And on top of it, we have the control layer, we have the algorithm layer, and then we have sort of the data layer on top of this physical system. And the, I guess the bad news about this power system, the bad news is if you look at the core transmission grid, we have about half a million miles of high voltage transmission lines in the grid. We'll have a half million mile transmission in the grid. I will not say it's impossible to change them, but also it's very difficult to build any new major infrastructure at this time. So if you look at our system, the physical layer probably will not change very much. Okay, there are sort of various issues as to why this is the case, but at least you know, in the the US and the North American continent is, is very hard to build new lines. And the problem, the issue is these lines are mostly built decades ago. 
So they're not planned with current technology. The time we build these lines, we never thought we'd have you no know, massive integration of wind or solar battery storage or electric vehicles. It was not something we thought about when we built the grid. So the bad news is if you look at the system, the underneath the physical layer, the core physical infrastructure layer, probably will stay as is. Okay. We may fix things when they break, but we'll not you know, have sort of new major grid. But the good news, the good news is everything around this core infrastructure, all the other layers can be changed and they are being changed. So even though the transmission lines themselves will stay there, how we model the system, how we control the system, what electronics we put around the system, what data we collect and what kind of algorithm we develop, really uh, sort of our tools to make the grid you know, as reliable as before and more sustainable. Okay. So the core question we'll try to answer in this seminar series is the following question. We wanna say, can we make the energy system sustainable? Can we achieve our goals of say, let's say carbon neutral by 2050 without completely overhauling the infrastructure? So if you're allowed to design the grid from a clean slate, then yes, we can have you know, very sustainable systems. It's not hard to integrate a massive amount of renewables. However, keeping the infrastructure as is or with very little change, as uh, you know, by changing the other layers or by changing the grid on the edge, can we make the energy system uh, sustainable and reliable? Right? And the answer to this, you know, I believe is yes. And we'll see why this is the case through, you know, in this talk, uh, as well as throughout this uh, quarter in all the seminar series, we'll see. And the one thing I want to emphasize is, one thing I want to emphasize is really right now is the right time to work on this, right? We have actually, this is probably the first time we have the right alignment of technology of the mathematical tools and sort of the societal drive to really transform the grid through the controlling and the control modeling, the data and the sort of the layers on top of the physical layer. So a chat you know, says, you know, where is energy storage? So you can think of energy storage really as again, a technology that comes to alignment, right? So if we look at this 20 years ago, storage will be quite expensive. Right, quite expensive, maybe not practical. Whereas nowadays, storage definitely is a possible technology to adopt. And the place where putting where you see most storage is again on the edge, on the end customers. So these are the technologies that will enable us to get where we want to go, which is you know is a clean and sustainable group. And that is where we come to the sort of uh, Clocum series, all the talks we have. I really, I think that, you know, we got, we asked these nine people, we got all of them, they all said yes. So I think Sam, you know, Sam Burden also said this last quarter is, you know, one silver lining this, where you can travel, as people say yes to this kind of talks. And uh, I'm really happy we got them. I think, you know, these are people who's working on the leading edge of the problem energy systems. And one thing is, I have not personally, uh, you know, collaborated with with any of these folks. So it's really a new perspective for everybody in our university to listen to these talks and learn from them. And the, throughout the rest of you know my talk today, what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit, you know, let's, if you look at this seminars we have, there are some common themes coming out of this. You know, if you look at the title of the talk. So one common theme is data-driven approaches. Okay, the idea of how do we use data to do better operations of the energy system. Another theme is low inertia systems. Okay, so low inertia will, later in this talk, we'll, talk, we'll say what low inertia means exactly. But if you look at the titles, quite a number of them is on low inertia systems. And you know, and the cutting through this are something called the DERs, these would be energy resources, which really means things like storage, solar, electric vehicles. Okay. So basically, if you look at the 
talks, the research directions is, you know, one is how do I use data? The other is what happens when the system has lower inertia, lower mechanical inertia. So to put this into context, I thought, you know, what I would do is I'll talk about the research we are doing in our department, in the ECE department, about how do we use data driven control and low inertia grid. And that will help us, you know, give us a common footing uh, when we come to the other talks to, to sort of process where they're going. So first of all, let's talk about the uh, data-driven control. And uh, we'll use you know, another example that's close to home. Right? So if you look at the picture, it's a picture of our own building, the ECE building. So the, way, the reason we want to use data, right, we use data-driven control, is a lot of the energy systems are quite large scale and quite complicated. Okay, so there are many, you can think of as a network, there are many nodes in the network. The dynamics is not you know, easy to deal with. And uh, we also want to control the system at the same time. So this is where traditional modeling maybe become a little bit difficult and the using sort of the new sensor measurement, the new data we have becomes you know, a viable way of controlling the systems. So I'll talk about some examples. So I'll talk about one example we have done. And this is sort of really the work by two students, Yuan Yuan Yingzi. So if you look at complex system and why we want to control them, the reason is you now we have a lot of uncertainties when we look at these complex systems. For example, if you look at our building and ask you a question of how does heat flow in the ECE building? For example, let's say you know, you're in your office, you change your thermostat. How does your, the air in your office you know, flow to the other place inside the building? This is governed by some heat equation and with emphasis on some, right? We don't, other than that, we don't know what exactly the parameters are in this heat equation. Okay? So we know this building, we know if, you know, if somebody changed the temperature in their own rooms, the rest of the building will be impacted. How does that happen exactly? We don't know. So there's quite a bit of model uncertainty. Similarly with a grid. So if you think of the power grid, Actually, often we don't really know the topology of the power system. Okay, so this system, again, remember they're constructed, you know, 50, 60 years ago. A lot, a lot of times these are not digital models. Okay, so nowadays we don't know what the topology is. We don't know the model. Okay, so when we want to do control, if you know, if you take the, your control classes, your first class will be say, okay, this is a system described by this matrix A the state matrix. However, in this complex systems, we don't know what the system model is. Okay? So I'll talk about one example of how we deal with this kind of model uncertainty. And again, let's you know, stay with you know, our own building. Let's look at why we're interested in controlling something like a building. So you look at the US electricity consumption by sector, building operation by far consumes the largest amount of energy. So think of this as HVACs. Most of this 75% goes into your HVAC system. Okay, so the air basically, we have AC, we have heating, cooling, air handling. This consume, you know, around 75% of all energy, all electricity consumed in the US. And the translating into monetary terms is not cheap. So our campus bill is about you know a million dollars per month. Okay, so we spend about a million dollars per month just on electricity cost for the campus. And the Seattle probably has the lowest rate of electricity anywhere in the country. Okay, so even for you know a very cheap place, this bill is significant. And again, the so if you know we have such large cost. Commercial industrial buildings are actually very incentivized. They're very happy to reduce their consumption. They're very happy to change their operation a little bit to reduce their power consumption to save some of these costs. And this is something called the demand response, right? So demand response is really in a power system. If you think a traditional way how I think power system is, the load is, is what it is and the generations are changed to match the load. 
However, this leads to issues like blackouts where it just can't mean the load. So if we have binary response where the load can be flexible, the hope is instead of, let's say you look at California, the example of California, instead of cutting power to 100,000 people, maybe you can do a little bit more dynamic response and not just to you know, cut power to an entire city. Right? So there's big potential on buildings to dynamically change their operation. For example, change their temperature set point to change their power consumption, both to reduce their own cost as well as helping out the grid by doing demand response and helping out the system. So this potential has been recognized for a long time. Okay, for 20, 30 years, we know building has tremendous amount of control potential. The issue is it's really hard to model this building. So if you really want to do a feasible, do a sort of a first principle physical model, of heat flows in the ECE building. Well, this is, will be some hundred order uh, partial differential equation, but it's probably more than 10,000 parameters. Okay, so building this system, this system is out of question, right? So even though we know it can do response, we can't get a good model out of it. Right? So this has been holding us back. However, in recent years, in the last you know, 10, let's say 10 years or so, we're very good now at building sensors. So even though constructing the first principle model is still hard, we can now build a lot of cheap sensors, cheap and accurate sensors, and put into the system. So it's very easy to say measure the temperature set point, the occupancy, and measure the power consumption. We have many, many sensors in the system, right? We can build our input output sensors. And one of the talks we'll have in the seminar series, will be from Sasha Wammeyer, who's a professor at Berkeley. She will talk about what you can do with this sort of low cost and high fidelity sensors. So for example, sensors in building is one example where we can measure current voltage, you know, temperature, things like this very accurately. So modeling is hard, sensor is cheap, but what can we do? Well, what happens is basically sensors gives us a lot of data, right? Once you have data, then we want to do learning on the data, right? So nowadays, if you look at the trend as a bunch of data, input output data, and let me fade in your network and see how it works, right? So I have, I, let's say I take the ECE building, I install a bunch of sensors. What I want to model is the, how the temperature set points relate to power consumption. Right? My control knobs are a temperature set point. What I want to control is the power consumption. So I want to control this. So instead of you know, going and constructing this sort of PDE models, let me just take some measurements, put this into the neural network and build a neural network learn model like this. Right? This is fairly easy to do. We can take, you know, a month of data and takes a few hours to train a very good neural network. Okay. So this is one example where, again, where technology, right? Technology and algorithms come aligns, allow us to do this building control, right? If you think of, again, 10 years ago, we don't have this kind of sensors. We also, you know, wasn't easy to train models like this. Nowadays, we can easily do both. Okay. But does it work? Well, yes and no. So neural networks are very good predictive models. So if you want to predict what the power consumption will be given some temperature input, we can do it. However, if you want to change the temperature set point to control the power consumption, you want to put in the closed loop system, then it becomes very difficult and also becomes difficult to obey some of the hard constraints we have in engineering systems. Okay, so this is, is a good prediction tool. However, it's not very good if you put into a closed loop system. Okay. So this is where the purely data-driven idea of just building a neural network doesn't work really well in optimization and control. So it turns out some engineering insights helps here. And uh, this is the idea of making the neural network convex. Okay, so for the folks who's not familiar with this, you know, we'll go into more detail about why convexity helps and why it's important to make it convex. 
So let's look at the, uh, so let's spell out what the control problem is. Okay, so our control knobs are the things we can control at the temperature samples. So let's say in your classroom, in your office, we can change the temperature set point from you know, 65 degrees to 70 degrees. Okay, we have some range we can operate in. Our goal is to, let's say, minimize the power consumption, okay, minimize power consumption, subject to you know, a bunch of other variables, outside temperature, time of day, occupancy, weather, things like that. So the idea is really, so the optimization approach is not complicated. Basically, I have my plant as my building. I have some mathematical model of my plant and I optimize, right? I, you know, find the right temperature set point to minimize temperature consumption. So this is what idea is. So again, the difficulty is, the relationship is quite nonlinear. The equations are quite complicated, right? So for example, when you change the temperature in the basement, if you make it hotter, all the warm air rises up and impact all the floors above you. There's quite complicated relationship, especially in a large building like this. We don't know the system model, okay? you know the system model. So this is a hard problem, right? I always mean hard problem. There's a nonlinear system, and I don't even have the nonlinear model to tell you what the model is. So what can we do? Well, if you look at the past effort, one direction is to say, I can build very accurate physical models. So if you work with something called energy plus, this is basically a simulator tool that solves uh, PDEs in a quasi steady state. Okay? So you can put in a thousand order PDE into energy plus, it will solve it for you. The issue is nobody will construct this model for actual building. It requires you know, how thick the walls are, how large your window is, which direction your building is facing, all those things. So we're, this, we can't construct this model. We cannot easily construct this model. So on the other side, we, you know, in the past, people have used things like linear model. Right? So when, you, when the nonlinear model is hard to work with, one, you know, one thing we always try is fit a linear model on top of it. Turns out it's very hard to fit a nonlinear model, fit a linear model. Uh, just the system is not very linear, even if linearizing around operating point, right? Just sort of very high curvature in the system. Okay, so linear model doesn't work so well. The actual detailed physics model, you know, is not very practically useful. So the idea is, you know, take all this data, fit a neural network, let's see what happens we put into control. So the control idea is you take the plant, you swap it with the trained neural network. Whatever neural network you trained, you put it as the plant you want to control. So pretend this neural network is now this physical building. And let's run our optimization problem and see how well this does. So training the neural network is really you know, not difficult. We can have very good predictions, you know, up to 95% accurate very easily. So when you put it into a MPC, the so-called model predictive control, when you try to minimize power consumption over several time periods, all, all you need to do is to shove this neural network into the state equation. So again, not very difficult. Right? So it's very easy to achieve in software. So the issue is the problem is not convex. Okay, neural networks for anybody who works with them is you know, far away from convex, it's very non-convex, a lot of logo, minimum, things like this. Okay. So when you have this optimization problem, we have this sort of highly non-convex optimization problems, then it's very hard to solve. You can do gradient descent, but gradient descent are very slow. And also what happens, they tend to hit many, many local minimums so the action jumps all around the place and is not very realizable in practice. So we can learn the neural network, but once you put into the control loop, into the sort of closed loop system, it doesn't play nice with the goal of optimizing power consumption. Okay, so they don't play nice. And the reason they don't play nice is because I don't have, you know, we, so technical reason is we lose convexity. This is, I don't have convexity. So the nice thing is, since we are designing the mathematical model of the building, 
we can make the neural network convex, right? So just because the entire reason this is hard is not convex, we can make it convex. So making a neural network convex is again actually quite easy, quite easy for folks who have taken convex optimization. So neural networks is nothing but the layered functions. It's functions that are the, you know, it's a layered function on top of each other. So we have this functional layers. And uh, we take a linear combination of the inputs, go through activation function and continue going like this. So if you look at this activation function, Basically, this is you know just the same function repeatedly with different weights. And turns out what we want is this function from the input x to the output y. So from the temperature set points here to the power consumption, we want this model to be convex. We want this model to be convex. And turns out it's not very hard to make it convex. So there is a theorem saying that to make comp this sort of compositions convex, all you need is for each of the activation functions to be convex and increasing, and for all the ways to be positive. You know, so practically what you do is you pick the activation functions to be this kind of ReLU function, and you pick this ways to be positive. That's all you need to do. Okay, so not much else goes on in this problem to make this convex. This is, and these designs are very easy to enforce. Okay. So if this happens, and uh, you can add some other sort of structure, pass through layer, things like this. But again, all you need is really just take the most common function, the ReLU function, and then make all the Ws you see positive. That's it. That will guarantee your convexity from x to y. Okay. So you can build you know, deep neural network of this form. You can build recurrent neural networks by restricting the weights and activation function. So we can do all this. Okay. And this is convex by construction. This is really convex by construction. Okay. You're guaranteed convexity, no matter how the training process plays out. Okay. So now we can basically, all it happens is before we put a neural network, now we put this thing called input convex neural network where we're considering the structure of neural network here, we're considering the structure. So the problem is not yet convex, right? We have an equality. You can see we have a convex equality constraint, right? We really want this to be in the objective function. And the turns out for most of the problems, you can put this into the objective function. You can flip the equality constraint into the objective function, really make it into a convex optimization problem. Okay. So, for example, we can think of time use rates for buildings. So what time use rates is, and uh, you know, many of you probably have seen this in your own electricity bills, is you get priced differently when you consume electricity. So when the peak, for example, during the afternoon peak, let's say between you know, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., your rates is higher than say if you consume electricity at midnight. So this is so-called time of use pricing. And for buildings, really, you want to you know, save, the, save money right? by maybe preheating your building before the peak or pre-cooling your building before the peak. Okay? So you want to take advantage of this time of use prices. Right? So if you do look at this problem, then basically my power consumption, uh, this convex function f of all my inputs, this being you know, the temperature set points, outside weather, things like this, you put it into the objective, now you have a very nice or convex optimization problem. The objective is convex, all the other constraints are linear, are linear and convex. So if you took Miriam's class in convex optimization, what you'll see is we can solve this, it's not hard to solve this. There's many algorithms out there to solve this. Uh, for example, you want to do a subgrading algorithm, then there's a one line function call in TensorFlow. Okay, so once you have this kind of model, it's trivial to solve the problem. And uh, to write the optimization code, the code is a few lines. You don't actually need to write a lot of your own code. It's a few lines of code. Okay, so I, I can make the optimization problem very easy by making this convex. And later I'll show you sort of the performance gain we have by making this convex. But for the sort of the technically, uh, for the sort of technically inclined people in the audience, right? Why why is convex important? Well, 
So I made this convex to you know, make sure we, I can solve this problem in real time, make sure I have good solution quality. But some things is weird, right? So the function is convex for sure, but it seems everything is positive and increasing. Right. All the activation functions are increasing, all the weights are positive. You know, but so the convex function can go something like this. What happened to my what happened to the other part of my function? Right? Am I losing representation? Right? So I made it convex, but is the model no longer very good once you make it convex? Right? So how do you get a negative basically out of this whole thing? Second is you know, how the fitting performance. You know, maybe the deep neural network is hard to solve. But maybe the fitting is so much better that we're willing to trade off uh, optimization versus fitting. And the third thing is, you know, why do I care about you know neural networks? There are other ways to make the function convex. Why are we using neural networks? Are there other sort of more intuitive, less sort of black box models we can use other than neural networks? Right. So let's see how we answer these questions. So the first one is. Not too difficult, right? pretty easy. Because the idea is if it's increasing from X to Y, to get it to decrease from X to Y, just put minus X as the input to your box. And that's all you need to do. Okay, right? So you duplicate the input, whatever input you have, multiply by negative one and also add as the input. And this will represent you know, all, all convex functions or most all convex functions, let's say. Okay, this is enough. So at least we capture all convex functions. And during control, during MPC, all you need to do is basically enforce this consistent constraint. But this is a linear equality constraint. This does not change the convexity problem. So the takeaway here is again, we're not going to lose out on if the system is convex. We can model all. Of it. And still will have a convex optimization problem. And the next is fitting, right? The way is, you know, does the deep neural network work better in the convex optimization problem? The answer is no. Right? So this is you know, some this is sort of real data we have. And both the Rn, so this is a without restriction. This is Rn we have. The mean square error about 5%, restrict ourselves to a convex R network the error is still 5%. So we do you know, equally as good as unrestricted. And there's a good reason why this is the case, right? So convexity happens because essentially because diminishing returns. Right? We have convexity because you know, we have diminishing returns, becomes harder and harder to change the temperature, right? You need more and more power to change the temperature essentially. And this is where convexity comes in. So we go a little bit deeper into heat equation. You can see why the underlying model you know, should be convex. Why when you use a convex fit, you don't lose information. You don't lose accuracy. And we can actually have much stronger statements, for example, in power systems. So we're not gonna talk about you know, in this talk, but if you look at this kind of control problem in power system, they're actually theorem saying the underlying problem is convex. So at the end of the day, you really should use a convex structure for the neural network. Okay. So we can capture all convex functions and we don't lose performance. Okay. We don't lose performance. So those are good reasons why we should you know, restrict the problem to convex, to restrict the model to be convex. And the reason we use convex models for use neural network, you know, is not just because it's cool or easy to code, but Let's compare it with some other models. One popular models you may have seen, this sort of max of a fine functions. We we'll take many functions, you build this sort of you know, lower envelope for the convex function. So you build a max of fine functions like this. So you, you look at the max of functions. Well, any of this kind of max of fine functions you have with n pieces, so n in the max ones here, I can achieve this with a neural network with n activation units. If you look at the other way, let me pick some. I can design a neural network with the activation units. Okay, I can design this neural network. It turns out this neural network will take two to the n of pieces of max of fine functions. So it turns out this neural network, because it's nonlinear layer structure, 
what really does this make the problem, you know, the representation much more efficient. You sort of have this sort of zero one thing being encoded in the different layers, right? So we have this, this T to the N, this power to the T really comes out because the neural network when it goes through many layers, you encode this sort of zero one activation, where it's very hard to encode you know, sort of other models. So we use a neural network because it turns out to be, you know, the most efficient structure we have. A small neural network can work as well as a very large, uh, sort of the, the sort of traditional models, right? So these are sort of the technical reasons why we choose a neural network. So let's see how well this does as a numerical study. So the numerical study we end up using, uh, this is a actual building in Seattle. So this is a validated, now we have the ground truth physical model for this building, or some 12 store hotel that was torn down a few years ago. But this was a real building we built a model on. And uh, the user has 16 zones and we want to change, you know, shift the zone temperature to minimize the cost for time of use rates, basically. This is the problem we have. And uh, we can compare many models, right? We can compare, you know, the uncontrolled system versus the convex system, versus the you know, standard neural network, versus a linear RC model, right? So it turns out, compared to the original cost, basically, a linear model saves you know, 4%, right? that doesn't make that much difference. Neural network helps, saves about you know, 10%, whereas a convex neural network saves us about 25%. So we have you know, a order of magnitude difference between a linear model and this convex model, and still does you know, twice, you know, more than two times better than a standard neural network. Again, the reason comes down to, we can actually optimize this in real time. Whereas a standard neural network RN, we cannot find the optimal solution for the optimization problem. So if you search long enough for RN, you may find it, but in this kind of real time control, when you have to make a decision every, let's say 10 minutes or so, it's really important to be able to solve the optimization problem in the time horizon you have. So that's why you know, we can do a lot better. And this shows up for the potential we have in the edge of the group, right? If we can have a building and uh, we can reduce the power consumption by 25%, that'll make a lot of difference to the grid operators. Okay, well, you know, basically, you know, if many buildings adopt this control strategy, we it will reduce a lot of the blackouts we're seeing. It'll reduce, you know, probably we don't have to cut out power to entire city, but just do the demand response like this. And then working with folks in the UW, working from, you know, folks from other industries, we're, we're right now implementing this control into real buildings. So this is in the building side. Broadening a little bit, you know, if you look, zoom out and look at the entire grid, we can extend the problem to the entire grid. So if you look at the grid switch gears a little bit, the same resource allocation problems have in the grid. Right? We're given some load, I want to find the optimal generation. Okay? The issue is again, these are nonlinear equations. So the power flow equations are notoriously nonlinear. For the students who have taken 454 from my class last quarter, you know this, right? Remember your homework, what happened in that homework. So this is not easy to solve. So how do we deal with in practice? In practice, we basically have a lot of heuristics. So what does heuristics mean? Heuristics means this is the actual picture of a control power system control center. So you have this giant board. You have a few human operators look at this giant board you have. And the job of human operators is basically to figure out what are, you know, where the grid is and pick the right heuristics to solve the problem in the grid. So no, like this is where no algorithm will work from scratch. You need some guidance, you know, right now from humans to tell you where to start looking for this nonlinear hard optimization problems. But now this is increasingly hard to do this, right? When you have a lot of renewable resources, the solar and wind, things like this, the human operators do not have enough experience to figure out what is the right heuristics to use, what is the right condition they should look at. Right? So this is quite challenging for the human operators. 
So a big push, you know, is using AI. We're learning to do this and the sort of active area of my group. And what I'm very happy is in some of the seminars, you also hear about this research going on in this area. So two great talks. One, the first talk, the next one we have is Sairaj. So I'm very happy Sairaj chooses this topic. Basically, Sairaj will walk us through the power flow problem and he will tell us, you know, why this is hard to solve and what we're doing now to solve this sort of very hard nonlinear optimization problems for resource allocation. And uh, you know, Christine will follow up on this. Christine will talk about how do, how do you combine data to really do the dispatch when you have many, many random resources or many uncertainty resources, things like uh, DER, things like, when, uh, so, so, things like uh, solar panels. So these are two great talks. So Josh has a question. Uh, in addition to power, are there other problems seem to connect your networks? Uh, yes, we tried it with robotics applications. We tried it with other applications. So basically, whenever you have a belief of diminishing returns, basically it takes more and more energy effort to change the behavior of the system, you have convexity. And this sort of approach will work. So just answer Josh's question. So you'll see some other things like this. For example, in Christine's talk, you see how do you combine through our physical intuition with the data we now have that's coming in. You'll see how we deal with these problems. And the another side of you know the grid, uh, another operation where the renewables impacting the grid is something called low inertia grid. So this comes in if you look at the current grid. This is all mostly traditional generators. So these are big spinning generators that power in the grid. If you look at the grid in the future, and not a very far future actually, a lot of these generations will be replaced by things like solar and wind. These are really coupled to the grid through power electronics, through electronic devices. Okay. And one result from this is, well, this future grid is often referred to as low inertia. So what does inertia mean? And why is low inertia bad or good? Well, we have machines. In your mind, you should have AC generators are these huge machines. Uh, this is a picture of a real you know, hydrogen, uh, I think this real generator. These are big, big machines. And the thing about big machines is they have a lot of momentum. So once they get going, it's hard to stop them, right? So they'll, they will keep going they be by, is there Newton's first law? So they have a lot of momentum. These are called mechanical inertia in the system. Whereas you compare this to a solar inverter, there's no such thing as spinning things in the solar inverter. Okay, so that's why we say things are lower inertia. Okay. So, okay, so why does inertia matter for us in the grid? Well, think about it. Whenever, let's say, you turn on and off your light, this is basically a little change in the imbalance between the generation and supply. And for the energy system to work, the generation must equal to uh, the generation must equal to low. They must be balanced. Energy must go somewhere. The generator has to equal to low. So if you have, if you let's say turn on your light or turn charge your phone, what happens is the big rotating machines, the synchronous machines, they'll slow down a little bit. So we borrow some of the energy that's stored in the mechanical inertia. We translate that into current that goes to you know, power, charge your phone. And then slowly we can put in, let's say more gas to the machine, more fuel into the machine, such that way it can come back to 60 first. And so this is essentially how the power system works when there are small disturbances in the system. Right, so sometimes you'll hear the fact people say that, oh, there's no storage in the system. That's not quite true. We don't have long-term storage. We don't have storage in the, you know, I say more than five minutes, but we have a lot of short-term storage. And these are the mechanical inertia that acts buffers. Right? So for all, for the folks who think, you know, control theory, the actual study question is quite complicated. To this day, we don't know, you know what happens when you push things closer to the boundary. Okay, we, so the way we design the system is, we over-provision the system. Okay, we have a lot of inertia. And so, okay, let's just 
stay away from the boundary of the system and the over provision system enough so we know it roughly works. Nowadays, we're pushing the system close to its boundaries. So think of you know, our old, again, our old grid, right? 50 years ago, we may have a lot of hair loop. Nowadays, we don't. And what happens when things close to this boundary, we actually don't know all that well, right? We don't know that actually all that well. So this was thought to be impediment to renewable integration. Because if you change the machines to something like solar invert, it seems to be losing inertia. It seems to be that will help, you know, will lead to lose loss of stability. So 10 years ago, people thought this was a big barrier to you know, integrating a lot of renewable resources. But this is not true anymore. So this is again where a innovation in technology or innovation in technology and algorithm together really change. This is sort of engineering achievement that change how we view the system. And the reason is we have electronics, right? So the good thing about like, so the bad thing about electronics is they don't have rotating inertia. But you can ask the question of why does that matter? Like I, I need a buffer, that's true. But my buffer need not to be a rotating, you know, giant uh, synchronous machine. My buffer can be this digitized, you know, can be this electronic circuit with digital control. So for example, our own, you know, Professor Brian Johnson works on this. So Brian asked a question of, hey, I don't need to deal with machines anymore. So you should be actually very happy as an engineer because now you get to decide whatever you want in this digital control box. Okay, you have complete freedom to design this. Actually, and we can actually improve the stability of the system. Okay, renewables, even the lower inertia can make the system better because now we have freedom to design Okay, ask the question, you know, can we work with zero inertia? Can we synchronize? Can we converge fast? Can we do all the things we want to do, but wasn't possible because we could not design these things for synchronous machines, right? So for the, again, for the folks who would see nonlinear control, you may have heard of this guy, Andrew. So Andrew now basically work, said, oh, there's this set of oscillators that has very nice convergence properties. And for a while, you no, know, for until 10 years ago for power systems, this had no meaning because what does this oscillator have to do with our system? But once you allow power electronics control, once I, you allow digital control, what you can do is I can design my circuit to act like this oscillator. Right? I'm no longer constrained by Newton's laws. So I can design the circuit to emulate this oscillator. So of course it's not as easy as drawing the block diagram, but basically what you can do is you can start off with the design character you want, engineering the polytronic circuit all around it. You can engineer this kind of circuits. And what happens is I can have a system with oscillators, right? I lose mechanical inertia, but by designing good control loss, by designing oscillators, I can have a very clean response. I can have a very stable system that synchronizes very fast. That is exactly 60 Hertz. There's no other harmonics. I could just get, just get 60 Hertz through this digital control, okay, through this digital control. And another thing that's exciting about this work, quite exciting about this work is we can demo this in a tabletop experiment. So this is a good demo you know, in Brian's lab on the basement of the building. As, before we work on power system, you know, machines and stability, you have to work with, you know, remember AC generator. You have to work with, you know, this, uh, you know, 20 ton generators. Now this, you can make innovations on a tabletop experiment. And so instead of working with high voltage labs that takes a lot of effort to set up, we can do this on a table. And this is for the real demo of the nonlinear oscillator I showed you before. So this again is a big topic of the, the seminar. We'll have three talks on designing power electronics and the implication to control of systems. Now, if you have the freedom to do whatever you want, how will you design the system? So this is quite exciting, open up the entirely sort of new area of research that wasn't there before. Instead of analyzing a system, we can now design controllers, which is very exciting area in my opinion. Right? So these are you know, some of the, probably the top people in this field. And uh, you know, these, we have three talks on this 
uh, basically going all the way from hardware design to the control theoretical aspect of this, right? And to sort of finish the two other uh, topics we have, remember we said low inertia, uh, inertia is short-term uh, short -term storage, undo we'll talk about long-term storage, and Joanna will talk about coupling between power and other infrastructure networks. So to conclude, what I'll say is, now this is a very exciting lot of speakers. I encourage you to come to all of them, ask questions, interact with them. And really this is the right time to do this research. We never had all three come together, the societal push, the mathematical tools we have now, and the fact we can do tabletop experiments. We never had this before. And now these are aligning at the right time for this kind of research. So again, you know, this concludes my talk. I encourage for everybody here to come to the other seminars in this quarter. Thanks, guys.